Israel should take the first step. Already what I was trying to make you understand is that it's not going to be comfortable. There is no way that the kind of change to achieve the vision that Pastor Finney articulated is going to happen without pain. There's going to be pain involved. The only thing is the courage to take that first step forward. For example, if you're looking at your local you know, demographics here, and you went on a campaign to invite as many people as you can to the church. So, for, for example, and then, then maybe say 10% of the invitations respond, right? That alone will, will carry some discomfort because they're not only all, all going to be Malayali, they're not all going to be, you know, at your standard of, of, of decorum as to how to look. And they, so, you instantly, the minute you have growth, you're going to have crisis. The only question is that I'm trying to say is be sensitive to the fears that the older generation has because they legitimately feel that way, whether you may feel it's right or wrong. And when that step is taken to become an inclusive church that brings in outsiders, there will be pain associated with that. When, we, when you talk about something and you don't do, what is lacking is not information. Then what is lacking is the courage to take the first step. And you look at the backlash and you weigh with the backlash, is it worth it? And when you think it's not worth it, then you know exactly what you need to do, but you just don't do it. That's why I was trying to tell you that knowing what to do is not enough. But let me tell you that the dis distance between, the gap between knowing and application really is courage. How many of you have heard of uh, Samuel Chand? Samuel Chand is actually from India. He's one of the top 10 uh, leadership gurus here in the United States. He's booked men of God, but booked solid in corporate. Here's what he'll tell you. He'll say to him, a mark of a leader, and I believe it to be true, a mark of a leader is his ability to endure pressure or pain. If you know that you are called to this outcome, that God has said, okay, so the, the, the final outcome is, let's, let's use those steps, right? The final outcome is to have what? A church which is a house of prayer for what? For the nations. That means that there will be several people groups that are represented. If that's the outcome that you want. But what you are here is a homogenous, predominantly Malayali church that is the dominance of one language in your main grouping, and your main service together. What steps do you take to become an, an inclusive thing? Right now, if I was just to look at what you are as a church... Sunday morning, you can either say, we're going to split this into two and have an English service on Sunday, or you might then put the emphasis on the SNL, which is your Saturday night, to be the one that has the language neutrality that allows all nations to be represented. But now, instead of just maintaining SNL, for example, on Saturday, you're going to put an aggressive campaign to build that. That's why I say, if you're going to put people in charge, they have to, be, they have to know that their job description is not maintenance, it's growth. So let's, I'll give SNL for example. How do we double SNL? If I was to say, I want you guys to double SNL in the next 12 months. Whatever is the number that comes in on Saturday nights for your English service. Because SNL began when it, it was more youth-centered, but now it, that's the English-speaking part of what you do, right? On Saturday. If I was to come to you, and, and because I'm not dealing with people that I, know, that I know nothings, I'm dealing with people that actually know how to do stuff. If I was to ask you, guys, I want you, I, I, I'm putting this as a requirement for you. I need this thing to be doubled in 12 months. What suggestions would you give me as to how they, that can be done? Advertise? What, what does that mean? In what way? Say it? Let the community know in what way? Social media? You can hashtag it, right? And it can let people know. What else, could, what else can be done? Talk about issues that matter that people really genuinely need to hear. So they come because there's an interest. What else? You can do a community event that lets people know of the time and the, and the presence of a meeting. Or what else? Bring guest speakers and guest bands that people can identify with. That are, wow, I like those guys. Let me go to IP and, and listen to them. And wow, I like the people here. Maybe I should co start coming out here. That can happen. What else? Target specific groups. Um, explain that. In, in what way? Um, 
community for different ethnicities. Now remember, even though with this one, it's, it's language neutral. So it can, all of them can be in one place, but in your outreach, you can target the different ones, right? To bring them in. In what else? Taking advantage of the, of the well-known holidays to do special events during those times that bring in a lot of people so that they can be aware. Because nobody's coming here unless they're aware that you exist. Right? And, and, and just in inviting them to a regular service, you might get a tepid response. But when you do special events, you might get an influx at one time. Then the next part of your homework would be how do we keep the ones that came in? How do we stay in touch with them? Back to school activities where you're giving out backpacks and different things like that. What else? Different layout, make it interesting, right? Make it engaging. Yeah. You know, increase the participation that takes place on, a, on people that do show up. Because people like something where they feel that they are participating, not just that they're getting yelled at, right? Okay, what else? Provide community service, but you know that you can provide community service and still not grow. How then do you create a pipeline from that community service for people to come in? Great, great answer, though. Do health events, because you've got a lot of people that are in the medical event, that, that are in the, in the medical world, you can come and do something that brings an awareness to something that you can get a gathering. What else? Make sure that there's connectivity within the church itself from ministry to ministry, that newcomers that can be plugged in to something meaningful, meaning expand your program base that people can participate in within the church so there's a greater level of participation. Yes, sir? Make sure that the leadership team reflects, reflects the demographics. You know, this is a tricky one. I grew up in Zimbabwe, believe it or not, the church that I, was, that I attended when I, was, when I was hired by the church was 60% white, 40% blacks. But it was 60% the whites that um, own land and the 40% of the blacks that worked for them, right? And um, then we grew and upturned until it was 40% white, 60% black, and I was the only black person on staff. And I had to go to pastor, and I said, pastor, we are the majority here. Why am I the only one on staff? You have to, you have to hire others that, that kind of look like me because we've got more people like that. It's not that you're, but it's, it, it, your leadership team must reflect the demographics. Let's just say that. Yes. Partnering up with, with, with local government and local politicians. Do that, and I tell you what, it works, man. It works. In my little town of Putnam, I could go to the mayor at any time and knock on his office and say, Mayor, I need an outlet, one of the city outlets, because I want to play some music there, and I'm going to be teaching the gospel to some youngsters. And you know what you'll, you'll say? Pick the place where you want. They ended up building a little amphitheater in Putnam, Connecticut, for our church. Do you know why, though? Because we're holding job fairs in the projects. The low-income places, we went and we just did a job fair by inviting the people that worked particular jobs to share with the people how to get into that. And when the mayor saw this and the impact that it did in that poor section of the community, whatever we asked for, we got. But that's, when you're a church in that community, you're partnering up with... So there's a variety of different things that you can do. The only question that I can bring to you is, A, do you have the courage to do it? Because any of those things will require change from people that they may not welcome. They may not want to do it. What, I'm already, I already enough responsibility with my children and with already with my own you know, um, Sunday school group. Now you're asking me to do even more? So willingness to actually just execute on, on, on one particular thing may be key. Have we run out? What, what else? Welcome to life. But here's, yeah, yeah, welcome to life. Exactly. So here's where you've got to, you, you, here's where you, we all just need to grow up on this one, right? How many of you are parents? How many of your kids can walk? Okay. Did they fall anytime they started walking? Did you give up on the walking project the day that they fell? So your kids are smarter than us? They're smarter than the church because the church got up, took a few steps, fell down, and oh, that's it, that's it. We're not going to do this again because it failed nothing of value. Here's, here's the average. The average thing that starts from nothing becomes something fails completely, a minimum of 3.4 times. When I say fail completely, I mean to lose everything completely. 3.4 times before it then begins to gain momentum. So the only difference is this, is that we don't even follow the scripture that says a righteous man falls seven times and gets up each time. Not two and a half times, seven times. Boom, up again. Boom, up again. Boom, up again. The eighth time. 
Then they begin to go. If we don't have that fortitude, let's shut this meeting down. It's useless. What we're doing this afternoon is useless. If we only try something once and it fails and we discard it, we have no business being in a business meeting, in a, in a leadership meeting at all. Because anything of value is going to fail publicly and spectacularly more than once. But what keeps you getting up again is you've got your eyes locked on the, on the vision and the outcome. We're going somewhere. Okay, so we tried to take a step and it didn't work out. And we plattered out. We're going to, why? Because our eyes are on here. Which is why the concept of positioning of, a, of, of you that are in leadership is absolutely vital and absolutely important. Any, any other? I, I can guarantee you the answer to the question you asked is right here, sitting on, 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 on a chair somewhere. The only difference is the willingness to do it. You guys are smart. Look at how many answers came with just that one particular question, right? On the practicality. Bam, 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 bam. There's no shortage of that. So here's the thing. Nobody is going to do that for you. You're going to have to make the step to do it. To execute on each one of those. Simplest way to double is what? what is called an each one bring one campaign. All you need is for one person to bring one other person in 12 months. If you bring your one and I bring my one and each one brings their one, we've doubled in 12 months. Can you tell me that being the nice people that you are, if, it, if your life's depended on it, if your future depended on it, you couldn't get one more person to come to this church in the next 12 months? You could look at me honestly and say, you know, Pastor, I tried and it didn't work. I just, I, I can't do it. Any of you here cannot add one person in 12 months? Churches will always have a guy like what I call Elijah. I had a guy called Elijah in my church. Elijah brought in, I don't know, 30 people? 30. We bought a church bus because of one dude, Elijah. Because here's what he started doing. He got saved and he's wondering, wow, this is so amazing. You know, how many people know this? Do you guys know that? It? So he got so excited and everybody else in the church was looking like this. So Elijah, when you drive to Bible study, he'll drive by a bunch of guys sitting around doing nothing, turn around in his little van and come back. What are you, what are you guys doing? Yeah. Do you have a couple of hours? Yeah. You've got to come to this Bible study, man. The, you know, boom. The, the next thing I know, 15 guys have come in with Elijah and he's leaving. Pastor, I'll be right back. Why? I left the other guys. I'm going to go pick them up again. One guy. Because of one guy, I baptized 25 people. Late November. In a semi-icy river. <laughs> it was cold. It was cold. Hypothermic. I'm dunking people in. Dunking people in a river. 25 people being baptized in middle week because of one guy. You don't, please don't insult me by looking at me as if one of you in 12 months cannot add one more person. The only difference is what? Are you willing? It's not are you able. You are able. But are you willing? That means that SNL can double in a year. And I'm being generous here. We can go one every six months. And then we can multiply, you know, twice over, compounding our growth in a year. The, the difference is not ability. It's not even in knowing what to do. It's whether or not we are willing. Yes. Mm-hmm. it might it might um, because if leadership is appointed that's appointing leadership for the sake of maintenance that's what you do when you're just trying to maintain when you're trying to build then you've got to give you know the position to build you know because sometimes it takes a, six months to just lay a foundation and then now you're beginning to build and somebody else that can come in may have a different emphasis and so you end up losing momentum. You know, that's what you do when you just want to be politically correct and you want to make sure that people are voted in and people feel important. But you're not putting people in leadership positions to make them feel important. 
You're putting people in leadership position because there's a final outcome that you want to achieve. So that might have to be redressed. It might have to be looked at again. It's what you do to get people to maintain something. It's not what you do to get people to build anything. Because you and I both know. How far can you really build in a year? Right? And if you keep, if you keep going up and then down again, and then up and then down again, and then up and then down again, what I always advise is this, is that when I appoint a person in leadership, I always appoint them to, be, to have someone who's under them who they are training. So that when it's time for them to pass on that leadership mantle, they're not passing to somebody who's not been in the leadership pipeline. They're passing to somebody who's already getting trained so he can maintain the momentum. But if we're out of the head just voting on somebody else who can be totally new, totally different each time, we're not really interested in momentum. We just want to maintain. That's just the honest truth. That may need to be changed at higher levels than this. It may need conversation to take place at, at committee and board, board level, but it needs to be talked about. Amen. And I know that part of the reason why they might do that is they don't want people to burn out, but if a person is actually making strides and they're doing a good job and they're gaining strides, they need to be able to complete the assignment that they've started on. And they, I'll just say this, always even with what we're talk, oh, about to talk about small groups right now, you always pick a person who's the small group leader, they must have an understudy who's right there being trained together with them so that when that group goes past 10 or 12 people, that one who's an understudy can start a new group. And now he picks a second in, 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 to run and then the one who's now left in charge must pick another number two. You're always continuously investing in the next level of leadership. You don't just pick people from out of the blue every year and then expect to gain momentum. It's just not going to work. Great question, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yes, and what you must understand is this, training even with what we're doing right now. Because some of you may say, I don't feel like I got enough value. It's just like driving. You can take, if you take your hands off the steering wheel, you can stay in the lane for a little bit but you eventually begin to drift. Every car will either drift left or drift right. Hardly will ever. So continuous training just helps you do that. Do that so you can stay on course. So please don't make training you know, once a year type thing. That's not helpful. But when you're constantly bringing leaders in to reshape and re, re, to make sure that we continuously... And Pastor, if I, I know I want to talk, talk about it, but you have to understand how... To, leadership positioning is the, is the holy grail. What I mean by that is it's the most important thing. Let me just teach this. And, 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 and my instructor, Dr. Dean Radke, has what he calls a tachometer. If you guys don't mind, I just want to share this with you. If you can draw this, uh, just, just draw two lines, like um, two semicircles like this. I just want to show you the importance of how you position yourself as a leader. Because knowing this is how it, what my brother asked makes things practical. So right here, put two lines over here maybe. Like this. And over here you can write tachometer. How many of you know what a tachometer is? How many of you don't know what a tachometer is? It's okay, just be honest. You don't know what a tachometer is. Okay, for the sisters, you know, it's that, it's in your, you, you, most cars have that, right? Uh, it's whenever the engine revs, the needle goes this way and then comes back, right? So, so when, you, when you look at it at tachometer, what does a tachometer measure? What is RPM? Revolutions per minute. It's, and its job is to show you how efficient your engine is running, right? Your engine is running, you know, efficiently. Now everybody's driving, you know, automatic. But we that learned stick back in the day, here's what we know. How many of you can drive five speed? Can Santosh, you never, you're such an American. My goodness, man. So uh, those of us that can drive, how many of you can ride a motorcycle? And not the automatic ones. I mean the old school motorcycle, right? What happens if, you, if you're stopping and you start your, 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 your motorcycle in gear number four? You're not going anywhere. Why? You can rev on it as much as you can, but what happens? Why is that? Because you're not in the right gear, right? Meaning what? The gear positioning is not conducive for where you're trying to start. That's why positioning, oh God, help me. You have to know where to position yourself as a leader because some of us, if we're in the wrong place, if we're in the wrong place, 
It doesn't matter how hard you're working. You can rev, you can make noise, but if you're in the wrong place, you will not get efficiency. How do we measure efficiency in ministry? Our RPM is what I might call response per mandate. Write that down in ministry. Response per mandate. The efficiency with which your team or your people respond to a mandate you give them. Start a small group. Two years later, it hasn't been started. What is that? Low RPM. What can be the cause? No action? No. It may be a matter of positioning. So right over here on top, right team. I'm going to say this right up front. None of what I'm talking about can be accomplished alone. The kingdom of God, I don't know how else to say this. The kingdom of God is not about one hot superstar and everybody else watching. The kingdom of God is teamwork. Amen? For me right now, like I shared with you, I'm speaking to you. I had to text before I came my, my prayer team. This session is covered in prayer right now. Because I refuse to stand alone. I've done that. I've done ministry when I was standing alone. It is difficult. And very little gets, gets accomplished. But when I call my team and I say, guys, I'm going to work. I need you to do your part. Why? Because I don't want to fight devils in the atmosphere while trying to sow seed at the same time. I want to, them to t- deal with that and for me to sow seed. So say this with me. Say ministry is teamwork. So that means that you have got to value other people's contribution. Are we okay? So now when you are a leader, the question becomes, you know, what, what is the best way by which you can position yourself? And the dilemma that we've had in the past is those that are leading, uh, uh, let, me, let, me, let me put this, put, put over this side here, hi Max. Hi Max. Put on this side, low or min. On this side, I want you to put right above here. Let's put micro. Micro is the small little day-to-day things. And over here, let's do macro. What is macro? Macro is the bigger vision, the end goal that we have in mind. However the leader positions themselves will determine whether or not we're getting maximum response per mandate. Ah, let me explain. The best place I can position myself as a leader, right, is where I can get maximum what high max right here. And so this side on, on the macro, I want you to put leader. This side on the micro, I want you to put servant. But if we're going to do it right, put leader servant here and put servant, rather, uh, put uh, leader servant here and, uh, and uh, servant leader. No, Felix, let's do it this way. Yeah, leader servant, s- servant leader. I'll, sh- I'll explain to you what I mean by that. That your team, members of your team that are dealing with the micro, that are dealing with the day-to-day, they are serving, but they're also in leadership training. The leader that is doing what he does, is leading, but is also leading with a servant's heart. You understand what I mean by that? Right? So, how does this work from a practical standpoint? From a practical standpoint, I'll give you the example that I had. The example that I had when I was starting out in ministry, I mirrored everything my pastor did, and I almost killed myself. So, what would my Sunday morning look like? My son, I told you I, I was ministering in the, in the prison system, right? I would wake up at 8.30 in the morning. No, I would wake up at 6.30 in the morning. I will be in the prison from 8.30 to 9.30. I did an hour service with the men. Then I had to leave that, hop in the car, drive across town, and I participated in my praise and worship team because I was one of the instrumental individuals. I had other people that were leading, but I needed to play drums or keyboard. Then I would get up and I would preach to the people. And after preaching to the people, I would send them home. And then we always used to let people write in, on the offering envelope, you know, their prayer requests. So I'll then get together with the prayer team to pray over the, 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 the request that the people gave. And by the time I got home, I felt like I was about to die. I was so exhausted. 
What was I doing? I was out of position. Why? Because there is what is called the dysfunction of doing. Because I was on this side, which is that, the side where I am doing the micro stuff. Every little thing I was involved. My hand was in every little thing. But when I am doing the micro stuff, nobody is keeping the eye on the larger vision. Because I'm too busy doing this. So positioning matters. So for, for those of you that are, are going to you know, take a hold of, you know, maybe facilitate in a small group. A small group leader doesn't mean you do everything. All it means is that you must find the team that can do the micro and so that you can focus on this. So as a leader, the greatest skill you have, you must master, is the skill of delegation. Delegating, activating others to, to work and then giving them responsibility and with every responsibility that you give, there's accountability that's attached to that. The more the responsibility, the greater the accountability. Are we okay? So your positioning as a leader is always this. I know how to do A, B, C, D, and E. Can I activate members of my team to do those things so that now you're always on, the, on this side of the ledger watching how they're doing. What happens when you come out on this side of the ledger? You get a higher response per mandate. Because why? Trust the giftedness of other people. Some people are doing less in the church, not because they can't, but because their gift has never been recognized. So look at what the disciples were doing in the time of the early church. They had it all wrong. They were over here doing the micro. What was the micro? Handing food to the, to the hungry while also trying to fast and pray, while also trying to teach the word. But what happened? There came a time where a crisis hit because there was a complaint that was taking place about, well, you know, you're favoring that group and not favoring this group. And they said, what are we doing? We have got to come to maximum response per mandate. So what do we do? We delegate the deacons to do the feeding so that we can focus on what the bigger vision of the church, which is training up you know, people to do the work of the ministry. So they knew they had to do less in order to accomplish more. That's the job of a leader, to do less to accomplish more. But in order for you to do less to accomplish more, you've got to trust the giftedness of people. Let me tell you this. If you have a low opinion on people's abilities, you have no business being in leadership. Are you hearing me? If you don't have the faith that people can do a good job, let me tell you this, even the least capable person you know is capable of doing far much more than they're doing right now. But if you as a leader don't believe that, please don't take a leadership position. Please don't. I'm saying this because I've seen it. I a pastor friend of mine that we were talking to and, he said, and, and, and I was like, oh, you know, um, they, they wanted to, to complete a, a church building that they were building. They, they were kind of stuck for a number of years. So I said, oh, you know, the, the people will have, oh, my people, they don't give. They'll never give to that. The minute I say that, I say, Pastor, I don't like that. What do you mean they'll never? Feel it. I know my people better than you do. And I said, I, I, I know people in general. And I know that when people value something, they will give to it. And one of them told me, you know, Africans, they don't like giving. I said, I refuse to, to hear that. Have you seen how much, you know, all those fancy prophets you see now on YouTube? Those guys are driving private jets. And they're in Africa. Don't tell me Africans don't give. They only give to the things they value. Meaning what? You have to have more faith in your people's ability or you have no reason leading them. So what does the leader do? The more you get into the place of delegation, which is the, on this side, it forces you to have to trust in others. It forces you to have to invest in them. It forces you to have to give some power to them to create an outcome. If you find yourself still holding on to every measure of authority, A, you're not ready to lead. And B, don't tell me about what you want to accomplish because you don't really want to accomplish that. Your, the positioning of a leader matters. It's the same thing in the, home, in the home. Like I was saying yesterday, don't do for your kids anything that they can do for themselves. Right? Empower them to do. If, the more you empower them to do, the more they can accomplish. Your positioning is up. The, the reason why I must emphasize on this is that, friends, if we don't get this and we are out of position... We can talk about all this and all of you are feeling overwhelmed by what we talk. I don't know how I can do it. I didn't ask you to do it. I asked you to be a facilitator to help the others come on board. There are others that are just as capable, maybe even more. 
They just need you to stand in there and say, this is where we're going as a group now. You come to this high max where you get a high response per mandate because you're trusting the giftedness of other people. The Lord did not give one gift to everyone. I'll give you the first organizational structure we find in scripture. It's found in the book of Exodus. I think it's in chapter 18. But look at what was happening. What, not, not the one that you, what was happening is when they were at, at Mount Rephidim, right? When they were at Mount Rephidim, here's what happened. Joshua was fighting in the valley. Where was Joshua? He was on the serving part. Moses had trusted Joshua to fight in the valley. So Moses was not in there swinging a sword. Moses was out on top of Mount Rephidim with his hands raised. Then what began to happen? Whenever his hands would get tired, Joshua would begin to lose. Whenever his hands were in the air, Joshua was gaining victory. So now all of a sudden, two men, which I hope you all are, one is called Aaron and another is called Hur, they saw that Moses' hands were getting tired. Moses didn't ask for the help because Moses was a hard-working parent. He was a good Malayali Pentecostal. If I, he did all the work, right? I will, I will tell you everything to start them. I will do all the work. But he's there now. The man of God is tired and he's not asked for help. Thank God for these men that created the first flow chart in leadership. Because one of them went under his left hand and they held it up. The other one went under his right hand and they held it up. And there you get the first leadership flow chart ever in scripture. Moses, Aaron, Hur, lifting up the hands of the men above them. So then what happens is those that come under Aaron and Hur lift, up, lift them up. And before you know it, you have a leadership structure where a nation of former slaves can now become a mighty fighting force. The whole thing that I'm, I want to encourage you is this. Everything we talked about right now is going to have to be executed on. And in order for it to be executed on, the leaders have got to be in the right place to do the work. To commission the work. And then to oversee the work. But if you all are afraid of upsetting people, you're afraid of taking the first step, you're afraid of the tension associated with change, then you're just not ready for change. Let's pick it up and do something else. The practical aspect, just to give an example, is this. In order for you to be a house of, nation, of, of nations, for, for a house of prayer for all nations, right? You're growth-oriented. You, 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 you want to grow as a group. I gave you an example of one campaign you can do to double in the next 12 months. Each one bring one. To what? To your English service. Can it be done? I don't know, you tell me. Just the ones that are present in here right now. If you were tasked with that, if you took that on as a personal task, do you think you could bring one person into this church to become established, to become a full-time member? In 12 months, if we asked you to just add one more person, could you do it? Let's talk. Yes or no? So it means we have not been growing, not because we can't. What do we do next that's practical? Invite people. You already have an English service. Invite people. So that what? For those that are resistant, imagine this. Imagine if those uncles and aunties and aunties that are resisting change right now, if they came in on Saturday night and found there was standing room only, and you told them this is what God is doing, anybody with the heart of God will see the hand of God in that. And they'll say we need more of this. But what we've been asking for them is to make adjustments and make changes without us ever showing them the fruit of that change. And all they see is that you're doing things different than what we were doing, but we don't particularly see a better result than what we had. What would happen, like I said, if they came to a service and they found out you had an overflow room with a TV set because you couldn't fit people in that sanctuary? Why? Because SNL doubled in a 12-month period. Do you mean to tell me that people that genuinely love Jesus are going to say, that growth, we don't like that. We don't like all those people getting saved and baptized. Chances are that some might, but chances are that most won't. You can start a growth campaign today. And again, positioning of leadership, what matters? For a lot of you, you are resisting, you are resisting growth because you are already overwhelmed with your present tasks. There's a lot of you that are in this room that I sense in my spirit. You're actually burnt out by serving the church at the level it's at right now. You're feeling burnt out. I sense it. I could be wrong, but I doubt it. There's somebody here 
you're, you're almost burnt out. What is that? It just means that your positioning may be wrong. And, and what we're doing is that instead of putting more and more leaders that are at the high max, that are overseeing works, we've got the very few 15% doing 85% of the work and they're getting tapped dry right now. They're kind of done right now. So now when you talk about a grand vision, all it does for them is think, more work? Are you kidding me? Please tell me it ain't so. So what must all our leaders do? They must migrate from low mean where they are all out there just getting every little micro thing, every little micro thing. You're involved in every little micro thing. After we set up, you know, the, 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 you know, the food and the drink as you did, some of you that are older, after you've done it for a few times, please, get some of these younger people to begin to do that. You already know what to do. You can oversee that. You've been doing it for the past three years. It's time somebody else did that and you oversaw them. So what does that do? It's moving you to the high, high max so that when we do ask you for a different thing, we're about to start home groups. You're not burnt out from putting out drinks and stuff like this. You're fresh enough to say, yeah, I've got kids that are doing that now. They do a great job. And for those kids you've asked to do that, you've just created another opportunity for them to serve God. So now they feel more of a buy-in in the church because they've got a function to do. And when they've done it for a little bit of a while, you want to move them to train the next group to move from the servant into the high max so now they're training the next group to come in and they're overseeing that work so that when now you're demanding them that i need you to be an assistant at a home group they don't feel burnt out they can hop onto the next assignment and then you begin to get growth that way what's your current positioning as a, as a leader for those of you that are running your group from 18 to 22 and whatever your group is i hope that you're raising leaders from within your group that will be able to someday teach as well and better than you that you're already identifying them and you are migrating back to what? Back to the high max. What do I do when I'm in the high max? In the high max, I try and bring people that are closest to me to a high level of competence. So the people that are next to me when I'm in high max, when I'm positioned right, I try and bring them to the optimum level of competence for them. Why? Because most of the stuff I'm doing here, I'm going to be passing on to them and they'll be passing on down the line. Why? Because we've got a grand vision we've got to attack. I cannot be bogged down on my inertia while going after a grand vision. I've got to keep moving. So then you keep that pipeline going. And that's why you find that when you go to churches that are constantly raising leaders, they are constantly raising leaders. There always seems to be a non-stop pipeline of developing leaders. You know, when you look at it from the corporate, from the corporate world, it's, in, it's incredible. In General Electric, in GE, when Jack Welch was running that company for 14 years, GE supplied the majority of CEOs that were found in the Fortune 100. Fortune 100, most of the major CEOs were all former employees of GE. Do you know why? Because Jack Wells decided that a good portion of the budget of GE was going to be spent on training his people. And when he first introduced that, some people were worried. What if we spend these millions of dollars training these people and then somebody else hire their talent? He says, because as long as we have a culture of training, even if the best of our people leave, we'll always be able to replace them with good people because we never stop training leaders. They never stop positioning themselves at high max and developing this leadership style. And they kept this thing going. And as it went, they constantly produced. So even though they gave to the top Fortune 100, the wealthiest companies in the United States on the stock exchange, they kept giving them their top leadership. They never lost. They kept on. And GE that started as an appliance company began to be in everything. What am I saying? How does the world know to raise leaders and we don't? How is it that the world has mastered raising leaders and we are burning out the same 15% people that are doing 85% of the work? We have to change. Why is it necessary? Because, again, with RPM, it shows us how efficient, how efficient are we as a ministry. What is the response per mandate? You have the mandate to make, what, a, a house of prayer for all nations. That's your given mandate. How is the response to that mandate being? How many people groups are represented in IPA? On a typical, I won't use Sunday, I'll use Saturday night. Is the response to that mandate been efficient? If the answer is not quite, it's usually got to do with positioning. 
Meaning what? You've got to activate. You've got to activate. Now look, when we went to the people to say, can you give us answers of what we can do? How many suggestions came up here? Many. Meaning what? There is no famine of wisdom. There's a famine of execution. The only thing that will stop us executing on what we know is a lack of courage. It takes courage to make that first step. Because any first step you make toward change will be met with resistance. Some of us have such a low threshold for resistance that just the thought of it makes us cower back to what we're used to. Begging the question, why small groups? Because small groups, really what they are is an extension of the pastoral ministry. Because one person cannot pastor 150 people or 200 people or 300 people. Forget about it when you begin to talk about 1,200 and 1,600. One, one person cannot successfully, and what I mean by pastor them is this, they cannot successfully be the only pastor in these people's lives. They need help. They need a team. And in order for them to get a team, they've got to come to the place where they can be high max and they become high max by developing leader servants and creating a pipeline where these leader servants are coming into getting more and more equipped until now they're raising others and raising others. So home groups presents that opportunity. How does he do that? It's because whoever is a home group leader has a bit of a pastoral role over the people that meet in your small group. So, for example, if Santos and Mercy, you opened up your home for a small group, right? And, 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 I, and I was your pastor. I don't have to call all 10 people to find out how they're doing. I just have to call you. And say, hey, bro, how's, going? how's, how's things at home with you? Oh, things are well. Is there anything I can pray for? Yeah, pastor, we're going through this, and one of our child, child okay, fine, I'm praying for you, right? Say, how's, how, how, how are the people in your group going? Oh, you know, Pastor, you know, so-and-so in their family had a bit of a difficulty, but we dealt with it. They're doing okay right now. Thanks for letting me know I'm praying for them. Now, all, what I'm doing is I'm giving you the, the, you know, the small group leader. You have more of my attention than your group does, but then you're passing on that attention to the members of your group. And so they never feel like they've been neglected by the church. They always feel taken care of. Because while I'm taking care of you, you're helping taking care of them. And then you're teaching them to take care of those that are under them. And now we have this continuous growth. That's why it's absolutely necessary that the bigger we get, the smaller we must get. So, one of the things that is needed, which we kind of talked about, I think one of the sisters you know, came up to me and said, um, you know, the more that, it, it, it was a very worthwhile observation. And she said, I, I don't know if she's still here. She says, Pastor Felix says, the more we begin to sit together with family as opposed to sitting separately, the less community we had because families would sit together and after church, they would get up and they would leave together. They are no longer connected to the person next to them because they're only sitting with their own. And when they leave, they, that's all who they've talked to. Why do we need small groups? Because we need to foster commu uh, communion and community. If, if you were to ask a first-time visitor that visited you guys for the first time, how did you feel by visiting IPA? I wonder what they will say. I wonder what they'll remember. Will they remember your hospitality? Will they, re will they remember that you reached out to them and their family and loved on them? Will they remember the teaching or the preaching? Will they remember the worship? I don't know. But those that researched this have found out that people that end up staying at a church, it was less to do with the preaching. It was less to do with the worship. It was everything to do with how they were treated as soon as they walked in. If they made no relational connection, they typically don't come back. Why do we do small groups? 
we want to increase the church's ability to relate to real people. One of the saddest things I found out, I've been doing ICPF meetings for the last few years, but in the last, our, our groups have become bigger in the last five years. But something happened in these last three that I did this year that began to kind of touch on my heart. I dealt with young people that were dealing with some very severe problems. Real severe problems. But the thing that broke me was that their closest peers did not know. I dealt with kids where I can tell which one or where because this is all confidential that had seriously considered ending their own lives. A couple of them that I dealt with had made attempts and their closest friends did not know. Yes, sir. To share. Okay. Mm -hmm. that, that begins by, thank you for addressing that. That begins by making a decision. Like right now as a leadership, we make a decision that if you are in leadership, part of when, when I'm doing leadership training, I tell you this. You will see people at their worst. I'm talking about at their lowest, at their most broken. But when your, heart is to, when your heart is aligned right to lead, you protect, you don't expose. If you, if you don't, confidentiality is absent. That's why I didn't give you name of, of the individuals I was talking about. Why? It's to protect their identity, right? And they know that I, I will not, unless they, with their permission. Some of them, I had to tell them, I need you to tell your parents. If you don't tell them, I will. Because of how dangerous the things they were dealing with were. I could not keep it quiet anymore. I said, you either tell them, or if you don't, I will have to. But somebody else needs to know this. You know what I mean? But please hear me. When we are now fostering the right kind of relationships in-house, and the person shares with you secret things in confidence, you as a leader must be trustworthy enough to maintain confidentiality, or I beg you, don't become a leader. Kindly say no. If you cannot keep things, if you cannot protect a person, please just kindly just say no. Because as a leader, I, I deal even with pastors at such a low point in their life that if people knew some of these guys were dealing with that, they, they would not know what to do. But as a leader, you protect because you know you are dealing with God's inheritance. These are God's people. If you cannot be confidential, please don't assume a place of leadership because you will do more damage in a life with one slip of the tongue. You will do more damage than the devil can do. So let me tell you about people. People are broken. Everyone you see that is so nice on the outside, they might be completely messed up on the inside. If you don't have the heart and compassion to deal with people at their most broken, you have no business assuming a leadership position. Because part of what you must create is an environment of safety. So for me, as, as when, when I'm amongst youth, I want them to know they can talk to me about anything. I don't care how bad it is. You can talk to me about it. Because if you're struggling with it by yourself, it's only a matter of time before that thing takes you out. Very important, what you just said, sir. And let, let's deal with this from a cultural perspective. If you want to be 
a house of prayer for all nations, IPA, you're going to have to be different in a lot of ways that are common in your culture. I can speak on this as an outsider because I've observed it. We have a culture that does not deal too well with other people's weakness. We don't deal too well with it. We become quick to judge. Oh, God help me. I've been counseling one of the sons of the one of the one, one of the most influential dominant Malayali churches in North America. You don't know which there, don't don't pretend to know. You don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I've had to recommend that this young man see a therapist. Because he was dealing with severe you know, mental health situations that were causing him now to be self-destructive. And all he begged me is, Pastor, if you breathe this to this community, they would crucify my parents. So imagine dealing with the depth that he's dealing with and having nobody in the church he can talk to. What are we doing? What is all this about? Your vision is unique because you want to be a house of prayer for all nations. You are going to have to be individuals that are compassionate with the compassion of Christ. To love like Christ loved. Christ walked into the house of Zacchaeus and never accused him of theft. Just loved and respected him. He confessed his own faults. If we are not yet prepared to become that type of people, then we are not yet prepared to have real community. If I feel that if you see my weakness, you pick up rocks to kill me, it doesn't mean my struggle ends. It just means I don't get to share my struggle with you. I was asking somebody, if you're really stranded on the side of the road, how many people in your church can you call and you know that they'll drop what they're doing and come and rescue you? And they said, I've got no, I don't think I can, there's nobody that I know that I can call. How long have you been in that church? For a while. Like, what are we doing? What are we doing? So what small groups are supposed to do, Pastor Fini, so that people get this right, right off the bat, they are to foster community and a safe environment where people can unburden the burdens of their heart in a safe environment where people will stand with them, cry with them, pray with them. Amen. If we cannot foster that type of an environment, then all we're doing is just pretending, man. We're pretending we want to be ministers. We're pretending we want to be about the work of the Lord. We don't really care. So how do we set up small groups? We set small groups up again by choosing, we might choose territory, Pastor Fini. And please, let's not have this conversation a year from now and nothing has happened. Amen? We might pick neighborhoods where we have a strong presence in our church. And so we can say, in your house, can you open up your home? Now, the person that opens up their home does not have to be the leader. You know, they can just be a person who hosts and just say, hey, people can use my house, but somebody else can be uh, called to, to lead that particular group. Now, the small group leader, again, I need you to understand, you are an extension of the pastoral ministry. So you have to have Pastor Finney's heart. You have to have the leadership's heart. You can't establish your own little mini kingdom. And even if you're a good leader and people begin to tell, oh, you're so amazing, you're so much better than pastor. If you start something, we'll follow you. Shut them up. They are speaking under the devil's anointing. Because those that truly love you when you're doing well is because you are completely attached to, the, to, to, the Lord does not bless anything with rebellion in it. Have you seen those people that, hey, I'm going to go and do, they, they're very gifted, they go up and they do their own thing and it never becomes anything. I've seen it happen time and time again. So the heart of, 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 of a small group leader is, I'm, I, the minute I say yes to a small group leadership, I know I'm an extension of the pastoral ministry. So your heart for the people has to become my heart. So I want you to lay hands on me and pray for me that the same grace that enables you to do this at a macro level, it will enable me to do it at a micro level because I need the help of God to do this. I cannot do it in my own flesh because I'll get burnt out. And if I get burnt out, having a small group will end up being a detriment to my own family. And I'm not about to do something that harms my family. So it's an extension of what? Of the pastoral ministry, number one. That means you have to have a heart that cares for people.
small groups is for inreach and outreach. It's to connect members of the church. Like, can I ask an honest question? Is it possible to be in the same church with people and never have actually had a real conversation with them? Is that true about us? Can we ask God to help us change that? How does this happen? By fostering the small groups, we're allowing people to actually connect at a smaller level. Because the more you grow, the smaller you must become. Or people will get lost in translation. They just get lost. So, when I know that I can be in brother so-and-so's home, is I know now I have at least people within the church, and then occasionally what we do with small groups, this small group gets together with that small group for a cookout. You know, because we're all in the same region, we're all this, we can have a regional cookout, we can have a celebration of all the small groups, where sometime in the summertime, we can have, you know, bouncing castles, and everybody, all the small group celebration, before we start our next semester, or our next season, of our next group of teaching. So, you are trying your best to connect the church relationally. Because here's what happens, is that the two people groups, you, just for me, looking at the demographics of this local area, uh, there's a lot of Indian churches, there's a lot of, you know, uh, you know uh, maybe even Arabic type churches, that, not churches rather, but uh, businesses that I've seen, right? Just about any person in any seven, anyone that I've seen is not white American. I haven't seen any, too many white Americans in, in Hicksville, I just haven't. So what, that, what does that mean? It means there are people that are of a particular ethnicity, they are brown, but what, what is one of the most highly uh, esteemed things amongst this type of people is hospitality. They respond more to hospitality than to anything else. And hospitality means what? When you open up your home and you come to a small group and they feel loved, they feel connected, they feel if they've got questions, they've got people they can ask that will love on them and pray for them, my goodness, it's probably the greatest outreach you can ever have. Because a lot of them will never walk out of, from the street to your church. No. I was raised to avoid that. But at your home, they might walk in and they are treated with love and respect. They see the love that you all have for one another. They are drawn to that. If you notice what happens outside of here, whether those that are you know, in, in the Arabic nations in Saudi that are doing church, the connectivity of the church is very strong in those areas. And that's what attracts outsiders to want to be a part of it. Because they see family in real time. And they say, I want that. I want that for my family. I want that for myself. So small groups A, is an ex- it's, a, it's a mini extension of your main hub church. But in a way that fosters communication, connectivity, and a safe environment where a, p- a parent can actually just come to the small group and say, please pray for my son. He's not doing so well. My kid is caught up in such and such. Can you help me pray? And the prayer of that group can help rescue. And because we all understand confidentiality, we don't, hey, do you know what so and so stand is up to? We don't do that. Because we know we love one another and care for one another. Because today it is there, maybe tomorrow it is you. So please be careful. But the main thing that we want to foster is we need to foster community. That's why Christ says the church is not an organization. He called it his body. And the, the, the health of the body is dependent on how well each organ is supplying, rece- receiving, and giving. Amen. Ephesians 4.16, by what each joint supplies. Are we Okay. So what are the different ways that we can run a small group? And, 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 and I, I have a small group. It's not really a small group now. It's now. It can be anywhere from 30 to 120 anytime. But I started it as a small group in a, in, in a friend of mine's house one summer, Monday night. He says, Felix, can, so no matter where I preach, I have a group that I have to speak to every single Monday. I've done that. It's going to be 19 years this summer. So, if I was trying to spread small groups across, I would have split that group multiple times and raised somebody else. The only reason why I'm even sharing this is I found out you can do a lot in an hour, 15 minutes. Oh! It's absolutely amazing. We sing for like five minutes. We pray for another five. We cover through scripture in a very interactive way, kind of like I'm doing in here. Even though in your small groups, it will be more of a round table and more of a, you know, facilitating discussion. But it's very interactive. We study the word together in a very interactive way. Then we take prayer requests and we pray for people. We pray for our local churches. In less than an, in about an hour, 15 minutes, I send everybody home. And everybody that comes in cannot wait to come in next week because it was so fulfilling. 
the Lord put so much wealth and richness in an hour, 15 minutes. On a Monday, after people had already been in church on Sunday. And there's members that have been with me for 19 years that will not miss Monday night. Some of you may say, Felix, I'm busy. I'll give you an example of what my weeks have been. In the last eight weeks, I've, been, I've gone almost nonstop. Preaching usually Thursday, Friday twice, Saturday three times, Sunday twice. Flying back to where I need to go to teach on Monday, on my Monday night. And for Tuesday, doing laundry. For Wednesday, prepping. Thursday, back on the road again. And at the same time that I'm doing ministry, I'm also trying to run a business. So what I'm saying to you is honestly is this. Even if you're the busiest of the busiest right now, if you just are disciplined in creating a small group setup, that does not take five hours. Because sometimes I know people that are like three hours this week, an hour 20. No, be consistent. I would say an hour 15, an hour 30 minutes max. Why? Because I want to be respectful to the people that open their home. Because it's usually on a school night. I want to be able to be in there and to leave so in time for their kids to go to bed without us, you know. But what is the most vital thing is that we are connecting, is that we are having an, a discussion, we are digging deeper in the word, and we are creating a relationship that says, listen man, if you are stuck somewhere, please don't struggle without at least attempting to find out if I can help. I want to be a friend in you so much you can say, even say, Felix, I'm at the airport. I need something. I'm like, bro, I'm, I'm, I'm far away right now, but let's see if we can find somebody else that can come and get you. But you know what I mean? We're in the church. You have people that can actually help you. The unfortunate thing is a lot of people just don't have that in their church at all. So we have these groupings of people meeting by the hundreds and the thousands, and they're so loosely connected that there's nobody that can be for, there for them when they have a real crisis. IPA has got to change that script. You've got to become that difference. So for some of you, open your home. Those of you that can lead, maybe Pastor Finney, the way you might do it is to, to say um, that people that accept leadership, they, they accept for a, a, a definite period of time so that you never burn people out. So if you say, you know what, make a commitment for a year and a half, and after that, we can renew the commitment. Or for a year, and after that, we can renew the commitment, depending on... Because if you're too busy, I, you, this you never want to impose on people that are not doing it like a chore. Like, oh, because once that spirit comes in, a host of problems comes with that. You want people to lead that are willing, that love to do this, love to be used by God in this, and they love people. Amen. So I would always say that those that want to be small group leaders, they make an annual commitment which we renew every year. Are you ready to go another year, brother? Yes, sign me up. I'm good for another year. Boom, they made that commitment. So I know for a fact that at least for the next 12 months, I do have Brother Feeney. He's with us. But the minute that you say, Felix, I'm overwhelmed, my brother, and it's not working for me anymore, I want to be able to say, you know what? Step back. The number two that we were raising, step in. We'll give our brother a rest because the last thing I want to do is to bring you out. Are we there? Go ahead. Yes. So, so the way it works is that's a decision that you make because any of those work, you know. Um, I've done small groups with the young people, which were young people. Led, so I raised young people, leaders. And um, whenever, some of them we used to meet like the day before we met for youth group. They'll meet for, for 45 minutes. And then all of them will then come in groups to the main service. So for young people, believe it or not, it actually works. To say the day that you meet, the SNL, the day that you meet, they would meet earlier for 45 minutes to an hour. Then they would all together come to the main group, it always made them come by greater numbers than when they didn't. So that can work. But for the other one, it can be, if it's by topic, what I usually prefer is that the small group is a time to emphasize on application what has been preached on Sunday. Because on Sunday, sometimes all you can do is to give the topic. But to discuss application, there's just no time. You've got 45 minutes. So now what I would do is that the notes that you have, the outline that you have for Sunday, I would either make it available to the small group leaders or ask the small group leaders to take good notes. Right? Because I want you in the small group to break down, to chew the cud on the steak that we dished out on Sunday. So what that would mean is this, is a pastor, whenever you prepare your notes, if you can put together a good outline, make sure that all the small group leaders have, and the small group leaders can then get their talking points 
from what was taught on Sunday to ingrain it inside the people. What then do you do with outsiders that come in? You are letting them know. If they enjoy that, you're like, oh, this is what pastor has been teaching. Do you want to come to church with us on Sunday? So they're like, what? They're teaching you this in the church? This is amazing. Yes, that's what we're teaching. So now you're creating a pipeline for those that come into small groups to come to the church because they're benefiting a lot from what they're learning in small group. Now they want to come to hear the whole sermon. So that's one way to do it that I, 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 I love. The other way is to just have your own small group curriculum. There is that group that's called, um, what is that? It just slipped my mind. What's happening, Felix? I'm listening to music at the same time. <laughs> do you guys know, what, what is that small, it's like it's, it's a small group that teaches the basics of Christianity and they, they meet, of, it's, it's, it's very famous, it's very popular. Alpha. What's that? Alpha. So if you look at the Alpha curriculum, it's absolutely amazing. I have seen that, that, that training series and that teaching attract a lot of non-believers. Alpha works for a lot of non-believers. What it does, though, it, it covers the basics of scripture and all this and all that. It familiarizes outsiders with what the church really stands for. So that by the time they come into the church, they already know. They, they, they are, you know it's, it's something you could do collectively to hold alpha groups. Alpha groups try and keep their language neutral while they get into the word of God. That's one thing, that, another way that you can. Or you can just decide that you know, if you do your small groups by... By age group, you can go by themes. The theme over there is dealing with this subject. The theme over there is dealing with that subject. That works for some people. I don't particularly favor that. I want us to be all on the same page together, to grow together, if possible. But what I would also say, though, is that small group leaders, if members of your small group keep coming to you and say, we, know, can we, teach? we want to know about this topic, we want to know about this topic, you as a leader, I would say, take it to pastor, pastor pray about it, because you might end up seeing, you know what, guys? Um, this small group has been asking for this and I think it's a vital topic. Let's get all the small groups discussing this. Now you then train the leaders on that topic and then they pass it on to their people. Does this help? What is the first step in small groups? Volunteers that will say, A, I'm open to leading and the next volunteer that's saying, B, I'm open to opening my house. When that group, group of people have been found, the how-to's can be you pick a leader and you pick an assistant to that leader. And when that group gets beyond 10, 12 people, 13, the, the, num uh, the number two guy that was coming up has got to establish another group. So you have to let members of that group know, guys, we cannot be 20 of us. That's too much. As soon as we get into 20, we have to split it into two. So get ready for the group to split because now, oh, I really get along with those people and now you're splitting us again. No, because we, uh, we want to bring more people in. Establish the same level of relationship with a new group of people. That's a healthy church. Yes, sir? Yes, yes, yes. It gets rid of that. Because what can happen if you don't have that mechanism? People would pref might prefer one particular place Maybe because their chai is better tasting, you know, or whatever. They might prepare that one particular place, and now the competition comes in. But when you know that once it grows past 10, we're establishing another group elsewhere. It keeps the right reason why we're doing this in perspective. We're not trying to become parasitic, grouping with my little group. I don't associate with anybody else. We want a church that is in community. If I have to go and help establish another group, I'll happily do it. Because it's an extension of the ministry of our church, and it's a sign that we are becoming successful. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a beautiful thing. Amen. It's possible. But the reason how you overcome that is you grow it to, to multiply it. That's what breaks the click. But when it's a small, same small group and that stay with each other, and also when you do intergroup activities, I always advise that, you know, maybe twice a year or even once a quarter, you do intergroup where all the groups come in for, a, you know, a social event together and we can give testimonies of what's been happening in your group, what has the Lord been doing. Choose a person to testify that you constantly are coming together, going apart, coming together, going apart deliberately. So that you, you know, familiarly, part of what I also encourage is that intergroup activities. Your group and that group, you're almost in the same town. Why don't you guys do, a, you know, a, an event together to keep breaking the cliques and involving everybody else? And again, to stop cliques, that onus is on the leaders. Amen. You can stop a clique if you're a leader by encouraging your people to love on others and to relate with others. That's all on you as a leader. Yes.
fellowship, a special event, you know? If it's twice a year, just do an intergroup power where you, you're getting feedback as to how others are doing. And maybe you can get a spokesperson from each of the group to say, hey, we did this and it was amazing. You guys might want to try this. So instead of pastor doing that, let representatives of that group share what they did right with their group that gave them breakthrough. So you're each helping each. Because for some of you, you, you'll find easier ways to do some things that will be very helpful to the other group. So we want to give an opportunity for you to be able to share with the other group that, guys, we were stuck on five people, then we did this, and now we, you know, we were able to go to 15 in no time. So now what you're doing is each is feeding each, and you're all growing together. Yes? Yes. 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 The leader does not teach. Yeah, and everybody comes prepared with the material. Mm-hmm. And then everyone needs to know that you have a time limit, how much to speak, and that dynamic. Yes. Because that's so, that's so that's what I'll, what, exactly. So, what I'll do is this, Pastor Finn, and I'm prepared to do this if you need. Once you've got the small group leaders picked up, we can find a curriculum to teach them because they have to be trained on how to do it. You, as a small group leader, are a facilitator. What is a facilitator? You are engaging people. You are causing them to talk. You are finding answers in them. You're not giving them answers. You're provoking them to give answers. So you are a facilitator. You're not a teacher. You're a facilitator. On the pastoral loving on them part, you're an extension of the pastoral group. But on the discussion level, it's everybody participating. So, for example, what you'll find in a small group is one person who's very, they've got all the answers. And they want to answer every question. You have to be able to say, not this time, so-and-so to the quiet one. What do you think? It doesn't mean that what brother has to say is not valuable. I absolutely love what he has to say. But I'm noticing somebody there that hasn't contributed. Me as a small group leader, I want them to know that their voice is important. So I'll pose a question, even a softball question for them to get involved. What we want is communication. I can, you cannot be in a small group and be quiet all the time. You'll be asked upon to say something. Because you're involved. You know what I found out? Sometimes the greatest wisdom comes from the quietest people. They're quiet, quiet, quiet. You provoke them to speak. They speak and you're like, wow, you're sitting on that the whole time? That is amazing. So now when they get validated, they get more confidence to speak. So no, small group is not moments for somebody to teach or to preach. It's always about facilitating discussion that majors on application on whatever it is you've decided as a curriculum. Are we good? Are we okay? We'll carry on with the training some other time when I come back. We've got a service um, you know, tonight at, at 6 o'clock, so please you know, make sure that you're back. Let me just pray for you real quick. Um, there's an anointing that, that comes with leadership, and I really just want to, I want to see if the Lord can just stir it up even right now. For those of you, now that we've talked about leadership, that can only say, Felix, you know what? I, I do want to be available for it. I just want you to show by lifting up your hands and say, because I know it, it means extra work. Amen. I know that. But if you can be honest and say, I do want to be, I, I make myself available for anything that the Lord will choose leadership. Sh- show me by your hands, please. So who I'm, I want to pray for. I want to pray for you right now. Uh, keep those hands up, please. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Father, I thank you for the leadership anointing, which is the, uh, the spirit of God giving divine ability to common individuals, to natural men, to do this amazing work that has a supernatural end. Anoint your people, Father. They want to serve you. They love you. They love your people. They love your church. Father, equip them beyond their current level. Father, let them see a change and a difference. And let them know it is God who is working in them, expanding their leadership capacity. Give them the wisdom to be leaders, the compassion to be leaders, the confidentiality to be leaders, the anointing to be leaders. Father, I thank you for now touching your people and just infusing them with the power of the Holy Ghost that can take a po- common fisherman and make him an apostle. The same anointing is present here today. We receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. I'll see you at 6 o'clock.